Hi, in this video we are going to discuss the experiment physiology graphs, especially that of the frog's cardiogram. So how, how do we draw a normal cardiogram of the frog? So see this is the experimental setup while we record the normal cardiogram. So here you can see that this is a frog, we have dissected out the heart and we have suspended it on this starling's heart lever. Okay, so if you are going to magnify this view, it will be something like this. You can see here we have got four chambers. So the first one here which is shown is the sinus venosus. This is the pacemaker of the heart. And then here we have got the atria. And then we have got the ventricles. And finally we have got the bulbous arteriosus. So when we record a normal cardiogram, we, can, we may get four components or we should ideally get four components. One that are the, that the contraction of the sinus venosus of atria, bulbous arteriosus and ventricles. At this point, I would like to tell one more point. There are different methods by which this experimental setup can be done. So in some experiments, when the heart contracts, the systole will be recorded as a downstroke. But in other experimental setups, when the heart contracts or due the systole may be recorded as an upstroke. That is why I have given two versions of the cardiogram. I have already posted the version 1 which uses a Starling's heart lever and this is the version 2. So this is the normal cardiogram and as you can see there are many tiny waves right. So here the upstroke is the systole whereas the downstroke is the diastole. So and you can see that in the systole there are many small waves here okay. So these are the contractions. So this is the idle graph of the cardiogram and these small waves are the contractions of each part of or each chamber of the frog's heart. So the first small wave is caused by the contraction of the sinus venosus, then by the contraction of atria, then contraction of ventricles and finally by the contraction of bulbous arteriosus. So this is the idle cardiogram. But normally we get something like this wherein you can see that there are only basically two waves. That is because the contractions of two chambers get fused. So the first wave is due to the contraction of the sinus venosus and atria, whereas the other one is due to the contraction of the ventricles and bulbous arteriosus. The next experiment is the effect of warmth and cold on frog's beating heart. So first we will see the effect of warmth. So when you draw the graph, we can first start with the normal cardiogram, starting with the systolic component first. Okay. Then we will draw the effect of warmth on sinus venosus. So you have to draw a graph like this. So see here you can see that the heart rate has increased. Why is the heart rate increasing? See sinus venosus is a pacemaker in case of frog's heart. So when warmth is applied on sinus venosus, the metabolic rate will increase. And so the impulse rate will increase and thus the heart rate will increase. Now you can notice one more thing, the amplitude has decreased. Why? See, when the heart rate increases, what happens is the filling time of the ventricles is reduced. So the end diastolic volume will also decrease, which means that the initial length of the muscle fiber decreases. So according to Starling's law, your force of contraction also decreases. That is why here the amplitude has decreased. See, force of contraction is depicted by the amplitude of that graph. So since the force of contraction is decreasing, we have drawn uh, the recording shows a decreased amplitude. So this decrease in amplitude is a secondary effect whereas an increase in heart rate is a primary effect. Okay. So here you have to draw in such a way that the heart rate increases and the amplitude decreases. And then you can show the normal recordings again and then show the effect of warmth on the ventricles. So here you can see that when the warmth was applied on the ventricles the force of contraction has increased. So heart rate is normal. But the force of contraction is increased which is depicted by these increased amplitude which means that the force of contraction is determined by the ventricles whereas heart rate is determined by the sinus venosus. Okay. So this is how we will show the effect of warmth. Now we will see the effect of cold. So first you can uh, depict the normal cardiogram and then we will see the effect of cold on the sinus venosus. So here you can see that there is an increase in there is a decrease in heart rate and an increase in amplitude. So why is there a decrease in heart rate? Because when there is cold on sinus venosus, the metabolic rate is decreased.
so the impulse production will decrease and so the heart rate is re reduced that is the primary effect see when the heart rate is reduced there will be more filling time for the ventricles so there will be more end diastolic volume so according to the uh, frank starling's law when there is more end diastolic volume there is an increase in initial length so there will be an increased force of contraction so that is why here we have got an in increased amplitude as i said before force of contraction is depicted by the amplitude so the heart rate is decreased and amplitude has increased that is effect of cold on sinus venosus then we'll draw the normal cardiogram again and then we'll uh, see the effect of cold on the ventricles so here you can see that the heart rate is normal but the amplitude has decreased why when there's cold on the ventricles the metabolic rate is decreased and the force of contraction will decrease so that is why here we've got a decreased amplitude and then we'll draw the normal cardiogram again so see this is the effect of cold on sinus venosus and ventricles so from this graph we can see that the heart rate is determined by the sinus venosus and the force of contraction is determined by the ventricles our next experiment is stanius ligature so in this experiment we are going to tie ligatures between the different chambers of the heart and we are going to see the result okay so the first ligature is placed between the sinus venosus and the atria right and then uh, after tying the first ligature we'll record its effect and then we'll tie another ligature between the bulbous arterioles and the ventricles and after we position the second ligature also we'll take the recording so this is how we do the experiment of sinus ligature so we'll see how to draw the graph so first we'll start with a normal cardiogram and then we put on the first ligature which was between the sinus venous and the atria so you can see that there's an initial pause after which the heart will start beating again at a slower rate okay and then we'll put on the second ligature and here also you can see that there is a pause and then the heart will start beating again at a much lower place okay so what is happening here is when the first ligature is applied the sinus venous is continues to beat as before but the atria and ventricle stop beating so that is why a straight line is recorded on the drum okay now after a while the atria takes its own rhythm and atria and ventricle starts contracting at a slow, slower rate so this is the atrial rhythm and for frog it is around 20 to 40 per minute now this is because of blockage of impulses from sinus venosus to atria right and then next we put on the second ligature so when the second ligature is applied the conduction of impulses from atria to ventricles is also blocked so that the heart stops for some time and then the ventricles will start contracting at a very slow rate now this is called the idioventricular rhythm and that is about 10 beats per minute right so this recording has only ventricular component that is why here you can see that there's an atrial component as well as a ventricular component but in case of idioventricular rhythm it will contain only the ventricular component right so from this we can prove that the sinus venosus the atria and ventricles each can contract at its own rhythm okay but sinus venosus is a pacemaker because the impulse production from there is more than that of the atria and the ventricles so this is the stenius ligature effect of stenius ligature now the questions that can be asked are can we perform this experiments on a mammalian heart if not why see in mammalian heart which is a pacemaker it is our sa node right now the sa node is situated on the posterior wall of the right atrium near the opening of the superior vena cava so the first ligature cannot be applied now the second ligature also cannot be applied as it occludes the coronary circulation so this experiment cannot be done on a mammalian heart now the other questions are what is the clinical significance see even though experimentally we cannot do this uh, experiment there are conditions which mimic this like for example heart block right in heart block also there is inhibition of transmission of impulses so that is the clinical significance of stenius ligature now the other questions that can be asked are uh, sinus venous is a pacemaker of the heart prove it with suitable diagrams so when a such a question is asked also you have to draw this diagram of stenius ligature name another experiment to prove that sinus venous is a pacemaker of the heart so another experiment is that of the effect of warmth and cold on sinus venosus right which we have di just discussed in that also we've seen that the heart rate is 
determined by the sinus venosus and the force of contraction by the ventricles. So that is another experiment which helps us to prove that sinus venosus is a pacemaker. Now the ex next experiment is the effect of vagal stimulation on frog's heart. So in this experiment we are going to stimulate the vagus nerve of the frog. See you can see that you have got an electrode here which is going to stimulate the vagus nerve and then we are going to see the, see the effect of vagal stimulation. Okay. So the electrode will be placed under this vagus nerve here. See this is the frog's heart and this is the vagus nerve. So we are going to place an electrode under this vagus nerve and then stimulate it and see its effect. Okay. So we can see that when after the normal cardiogram we are going to apply the stimulus. So when the stimulus is applied after some time the heart will stop in diastole. So that is known as vagal inhibition. The inhibition of this uh, heart by vagus is known as vagal inhibition. So that the heart stops in diastole and if the stimulus is continued we can see that even in spite of the uh, stimulation the heart will start beating at a slower rate which is the idioventricular rhythm which means this is the heart has escaped this vagal inhibition and that is known as vagal escape. Okay. Now once the stimulus is stopped we can see that there will be normal contractions again. So this is the effect of vagal stimulation. See when we stimulated the heart the heart stopped in diastole. Now that is known as vagal inhibition. After some time the heart starts beating at its own rate which is known as the idioventricular rhythm and that is known as vagal escape. Once the stimulus is stopped there will be normal contractions again. So this is the effect of vagal stimulation. Now the questions that can be asked are define vagal tone. What are the causes of vagal inhibition and what are the causes of vagal escape. Okay. Now the next experiment is the refractory period of frog's heart. So the aim of this experiment is to find out the refractory period or demonstrate the refractory period of the frog's beating heart. So for this we stimulate the ventricles at different phases of the cardiac cycle and we want to see its effect. So if this is a normal cardiogram we are going to stimulate it at different phases like during the systole and during the early part of diastole. In both these cases we can see that there is absolutely no change and a normal cardiogram itself is recorded. But when we stimulate during the later part of the diastole, here you can see that there is another contraction superimposed on the normal one, right? And that there is a compensatory pause after this. And then the next beat after this uh, uh, stimulus has got an increased amplitude and that is known as the post extrasystolic potentiation, right? So when the second stimulus was applied during the relative refractory period or during the later part of the diastole, it was seen that there was an extra contraction superimposed on the first one which is known as extra systole. Then there was a compensatory pause and the contraction after that had an increased amplitude and that is known as post extra systolic potentiation. So when you draw this graph you have to make sure that this gap between the application of the stimulus and the next one is, in, is included in two cardiac cycles. Okay? So the duration here should have two cardiac cycles. So when you draw that you have to draw it in such a way. Now the questions that can be asked are can cardiac muscle be tetanized and explain. So we already know about how long the cardiac the refractory period of a cardiac muscle is and its different phases the absolute refractory period and the relative refractory period. So we have to say about that here. And also you have to know the ionic basis of the long refractory period in cardiac muscle. So these are the questions that can be asked. So in this video we have discussed the normal cardiogram, the effect of warmth and cold on sinus venosus and ventricles. We have also seen the stannous ligature, the effect of vagal stimulation as well as the we have demonstrated the refractory period. Okay. So I hope these graphs are clear. Thank you.